Welcome to UFO Sunday at UFO Denmark. I'm Astrid. Today it's going to be all about CE5, human initiated contact with extraterrestrial beings. And we are very happy to have Kasta Macrius as our guest on the show today. Welcome, Kasta. Thank you for joining us. Welcome, and thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. It's certainly our pleasure. Um, you are here to tell us about the community's ET Let's Talk and the People's Disclosure Movement. But first, could you please tell us a bit about your background and how you came to be a founder and global networker for the two communities? Oh, how many days have you got? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I will try to keep it short. Um, I like to say to everyone that we, those of us who've come to this interest, this topic, all of us have a story. So what you're asking me is the type of question or is the question that I ask other people, how did you come by this interest? Uh, because it's not a very uh, common thing and we hope it'll be, become even more common. Uh, basically, I grew up in the American Midwest in a very conservative part of the country in the United States um, in um, the 60s and the 70s when I was a teenager and a young man. Uh, there was not much that you could find. There was no internet. However, there was the uh, contacting movement of the 50s, the 60s, and part of the 70s, where before my time, before any of our times, uh, there, there was contact being made by people like George Adamski and others. And they were writing books back then and holding conventions. And there was quite a flap and flurry of interest and they, they really started uh, this ufology kind of interest that we all take for granted now. That contacting movement, um, uh, one of those people produced a book that as a child, I, I picked it up. I don't remember which one. It might have been one of George Adamski's books. Um, and it had pictures in it of, of UFOs, you know, the, the classic uh, with the dome shape and the classic saucer. Um, on the cover and inside many more pictures and the author's stories of how he had had contact with, uh, at, I think at that time it was the Venusians, and um, had messages, etc. I was just, as I like to say, gobsmacked. I, I don't know if everyone uses that slang, but you may understand that it just means I was just immediately smitten by all of that, and I knew right away that I wanted to learn more about these these visitors. Um, as a young man, I was interested in um, science fiction. I read a lot. I was interested in science. I was interested in astronomy, and I had my own telescope. And so my eyes were always up into the heavens, you know, wondering, looking at the wonder and the awe that was out there, and wondering if there are uh, other beings. So it was really natural for me when I picked up this UFO book to to be smitten the way that I was. Um, I felt like I had come home. The thing is, though, that I, um, I, I dropped that interest and I had a very conventional sort of life um, after that. Um, I went to university. Uh, I got a um, bachelor's degree in computer science with a minor in mathematics. And so I traveled very much the left-brained scientific route for many years after that. I came to, the, to California here, to the Silicon Valley, and I had a uh, decades-long career as a software consultant in, in the Silicon Valley. So uh, what I'm trying to say is I was very well grounded in the, the scientific world, and I enjoyed it. I was good at it. I made my living that way. I was successful. And then in 2006, I discovered the, the Disclosure Project and looked at the videos of uh, uh, whistleblowers that came from the different um, agencies talking about their experience. And my interest was renewed at that point in 2006. And uh, it was like drinking from a fire hose, <laughs> we like to say, because, of course, the Internet, if you try to put the, the search term UFO, in, into a search engine, you're going to come up with millions of results. And the afternoon that um, I discovered that project was like that. There was just a lot of information. But for some reason, when I discovered that we can do human-initiated contact, I knew that I had to participate in that and to give that a try. Um, so, um, and I'm trying to make this a shorter story here, but uh, 
there was a week in September of 2006 that changed my life and caused me to found, to be the founder of um, btletstalk.com and the People's Disclosure Movement and the People's Love Alliance and the Global CE5 Initiative, et cetera. During that week, when I was with uh, maybe 50 other people, I was learning CE5 for the first time um, at Mount Shasta in Northern California, which is known to be a very active spiritual and UFO hotspot uh, and has been for decades. So we were experiencing uh, many of the lights in the skies, all the traditional things that, that we talk about, zigzagging, pulsing, flashing at us, orbs in the trees that we could see. It's so many um, responses to us doing the CE5. So I knew that this was something very, that, that it worked and it was worthwhile. Um, I had two experiences during that week that really changed my life. Um, one of them was actually watching a small starcraft, a sphere, materialize in front of me and nine other people for half an hour. Uh, this was one night after most of the group had departed from that evening's activities of doing a sky watch. Uh, the rest of us watched this craft, and it wasn't, was not too, too far away from me, just suddenly materialize out of thin air. It didn't become totally solid, but it was very opaque. And you knew it was there, and it was undeniable, and all of us saw it. And for half an hour, it floated there uh, just a few inches above the ground. It was maybe uh, three or four feet in diameter. And we, uh, nobody took a picture, which is kind of weird. We had cameras. I think we were all just <laughs> trying to uh, get used to this experience because we recognized that our CE5 activity in trying to connect with our star friends had produced results and not only in the sky, but suddenly here on the ground in front of us. Um, during that half hour, one of the uh, gentlemen in our group got a telepathic message from the pilots inside of that craft who said to him that they are scientists and they are here on earth studying the human energy system. So uh, we were the result, I guess, of a, a research project, <laughs> a cosmic one. And that was really kind of cool. It, it wasn't, um, it was the kind of message that I was very resonant with, like, oh, this is a scientific expedition. They're here. They showed up to be with us. And for the next half hour, they approached the woman standing next to me who did not move for that half hour. And um, we did not know what was going on, but I stood by her to make sure that if there was any sign of distress, that I could, you know, be there to help her. Um, after that half hour, she did show some, some um, uh, imbalance, like she was going to fall, and I steadied her, and I asked her what happened. And she said that one of the scientists from that craft approached her telepathically and asked her if he could merge with her, or if it, it I don't know if it was a he, she, or an it, could merge with her to study her energy system. And this very brave woman um, and we didn't know any of this because she was just standing there for that half hour and we didn't know what was going on. But during that time, she was saying yes to that request to merge with her. And um, she had the presence of mind to ask to tell this being, uh, you may do this, but I have three conditions. So she was negotiating already and uh, putting out her limits. And one of the conditions was that she remained conscious of during that period that she was being studied. She did not want to be unaware of her surroundings. Uh, the being agreed to that. And her second uh, condition was that the being leave when she said, time to go. And the being agreed to that. The third condition was that there should be no messing with her sexual organs, no probing or anything in those areas. And she was quite serious about that. And the being, I think, understood that and said, that's fine, too. I won't do that. So at the end of that half hour is when she had decided and said to the being internally, time to go now. And that scientist left. And as I sat there listening to what she was telling me about this story, I noticed that the, um, the small spherical starcraft started dissolving, you know, just a slow dissolve into the background. And then it was gone noiselessly in the same way that it came. 
that encounter was very profound. It was not a second or a third hand story, the way that you might hear from other people whom you believe and trust that they had a genuine UFO experience. Um, and I have had those. Uh, uh, I've been told by people that I trust dramatic encounters with motherships, with crafts over their cars and all that. And I believed all that. But there's nothing like something happening to you for the first time. And that's what changed my life right there. I thought, um, I want to do more of this contact. Uh, I want to get to know my cosmic friends because they did show up. And uh, that's when I decided to do more networking uh, with global groups to try to create a community because I knew that I was not alone. Uh, there were many, many other people with stories like this. There was another event that happened that week where some uh, small Arcturians showed up in our bedroom back home because my wife had said to me before I left for this, um, this um, um, CE5 week of encounters, she had said, uh, go have fun. Um, it's not personal to me. Uh, I won't come with you. I have businesses to run. But I do believe that they are out there, that they're here. It's a huge universe. It's full of life. But go have fun. It's not personal to me, and, and I support you. Uh, during that week, I was calling her every morning and, and telling her about the previous night's activities uh, because it was all new to me and very exciting. And about the fourth morning, she stopped me and said, wait a minute, I've got a story for you. And I thought to myself, what could be more exciting than what I had seen last night? <laughs> and uh, she was right. It was. Uh, because um, as soon as she turned out the light in our bedroom back here at home, uh, at the foot of the bed, there were four, maybe five beings about three and a half feet tall standing there silently looking at her. They had large heads, big almond eyes, thin necks, thin arms. Um, she couldn't see much of a mouth and uh, couldn't see the lower parts of their body because at the end of the bed, the bed was obscuring the lower parts of their body. So they were physical enough that our physical bed was covering part of them. Um, and you have to understand my wife, though she's a clairvoyant and has tremendously great inner clairvoyant vision. Uh, she's a professional psychic and she's done that. Her outer vision is strictly with her normal eyes. So what she was seeing these beings were with her regular eyes and she sees very well in the dark. And there they were standing there and there were waves of love coming off of them and they were enveloping my wife. She was startled but not afraid because as she says, how can you be afraid of that much love? And they said to her telepathically um, in a very sing-song way, who are you? We theorized that they had found me up in Mount Shasta while I was doing these uh, exercises with my friends. And because I was very closely connected with her and communicating with her during the week, they must have found my energy and then decided to follow the link to see what it was that was at the other end of my communication. And that's how we believe they came to our home, literally. There they were in the bedroom. And my wife thought after a while I should ask them something. To this day, she regrets that she didn't ask them, how did you get here? But instead, she said, where are you from? Which is a very uh, normal kind of question to ask. And again, telepathically, in a very sing-song way, they said to her slowly, Arcturus. And then they kind of faded out, and they were gone, just as silently as they came. So my wife asks me, after she tells me this story, and I'm, of course, my, my jaw has hit the ground. I'm amazed. I didn't expect this. And you have to understand, my wife is also the kind of person who did not grow up reading science fiction. She doesn't have a great imagination for these kinds of things. She's had no desire to ever want to meet anybody cosmic. It just was never her interest. So the fact that this experience happened to her validated for her that it was something genuine because she, was, she, know what, she knows what she saw in the same way that I know what I experienced uh, with that sphere. Um, and it was never, never anything that she was hoping to get. So she was not delusional or fantasizing or making it up. Uh, she was fully awake. This was a real experience for her. And like I said, those two experiences then um, really cemented it for us. Her last comment to me before we hung up the phone was, well, 
it's personal now. I'm coming with you next year. And we have been together doing this work since that time. Now we have the ET Let's Talk community, which I founded. We have um, about 50,000 people all over the world in more than 100 countries. And we've been making monthly contact uh, via the Global CE5 initiative uh, that I founded in 2010. Uh, we've been making monthly contact in our groups all over the planet. Uh, people have produced videos, pictures, stories. I I've lost count. And so we have this community now that is building a group field of welcome and open invitation to um, our star friends, our star visitors. So in a very um, 20,000 foot level case, this is a perspective. We are that global group. We, you're part of it and so many other C5 groups are. And I'm so grateful for all the people over the years who have joined and have shared their stories and become part of the community and have created networks of their own uh, because that's what it's all about is to keep growing this organically. Uh, you have your experience, you teach someone else and they teach someone else. And sooner or later then you have a people's disclosure. Um, and that's one of the major things I, I like to talk about, which is the people's disclosure movement. Uh, we are told by our star friends that in 2019, we did achieve a people's disclosure. Now, you know, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that in ufology there, and I was one of them, many people continuing to wait for a government, a, a government body, a prime minister, a premier, a president somewhere to make a huge announcement to the press of the world and say, you know what? We've been lying to you for 70 years. Yeah, they've been visiting here. We've had conversations with them. And we've been calling you crazy and ruining your careers and throwing you into institutions. But we're sorry about that. They really are here. You were right all along, and we covered it up. I'm not waiting for any government or anybody to do that. Uh, so waiting for that kind of disclosure is, in fact, giving your power over to somebody else while you're waiting for them to give you the word and to tell you the truth that you already know because like me thousands of us have been out in the field and we have seen with our eyes we have felt with our hearts we know they're here many times over so why wait for someone else to tell you what you know and that's what the people's disclosure movement is about in 2010 my star friends contacted us and they asked that we create as many et contact teams as possible in as many places as possible, as quickly as possible. And I asked them, uh, well, at first I said, that's great, I can do that. I'll, I'll start uh, organizing people and teaching people. But I asked them, what's the end game? And they said that someday if enough humans who have uh, tried to make contact them, with them have given them enough permission, as humans give them permission, they would show up in more places and more cities where more people would see them, and as more people see them, that will give them more permission to appear in many more cities. So this becomes an organic kind of thing. Like, and they called it a, uh, a virtuous circle because we, we ask, they respond. We, we ask again, they respond in more places. More of us see them, etc. And that's what's been happening uh, since 2010 when I was asked to do that. Uh, and thanks to everyone who's listening here and who have done this work month after month, day after day, week after week, they tell us that in 2019, a tipping point was because they told me in 2010, someday a tipping point will be reached where so many people have seen us in so many places that a cover up of our presence moving forward, not about the past, but moving forward from that tipping point, a cover-up will no longer be possible. People will know their own truth, and they will stick by it, and we will enter a new era. That happened in 2019. There are 1.3 billion people, according to recent research, who believe that star civilizations exist and that we should contact them. 1.3 billion, that's billion with a B. One out of seven people, maybe one out of six, actually, on the planet, adults. So though we're not a majority, there are many more of us who believe and who've disclosed to ourselves because we have now become 
knowers instead of believers, um, we reach that tipping point. A cover-up is no longer possible anywhere. So we're done with listening to governments about this because how many of us trust governments and what they tell us? We have trusted ourselves for the last few years, making our own contact and teaching each other. And we, the people, have become the disclosure. And that's really what I want to get across to people. The disclosure has happened. Stop asking for it. And you were a part of it. And you are still a part of it because there is more that will continue unfolding. Um, and, and it's a very positive thing. And I know there's other topics around the fact of our friends appearing that uh, you may want to, uh, to ask. So um, I will stop here and, and thank you for the time to give you a lot of this uh, deep background um, as to how I got here. Okay, thank you, Costa. Um, I was going to ask you, what, what, what's your most memorable CE contact? But I believe you just answered that at Mount Shasta <laughs> because it was very, <laughs> very significant. Um, yes, go okay. ahead. Well, uh, what advice do you have for people who would like to get started with CE5 but are a bit afraid of it because they never tried it? Well, it's one thing, it depends on the kind of fear we're talking about. And that's a good question because fear is common to a lot of people. Um, to one degree or another, people may be afraid of what they're going to encounter. And I have to say, when I had my first experience using it, I went to this group um, meeting where we were doing CE5 for the first time. And even though I was excited, I had a little bit of fear because I grew up with all the Hollywood movies of, you know, aliens that were going to invade us and, and eat us and take our women, you know, whatever the, the theme was. There were so many of those. And that has a profound influence on you when you're a child. So I know what I'm, I feel I know what I'm talking about when, when you ask about the fear thing. I had it in myself until I had my first experience and then that disappeared. I would say for people that, um, one, go deeply inside and within and ask yourself what the fear is. Uh, you have to do a little bit of work on yourself. Uh, it's true that if you have a group where you're trying to make contact and someone has a lot of fear, it's not going to happen. Uh, the CE5 protocol depends on people coming to it to be in harmony, to be open with goodwill and uh, an open mind, a loving heart, a sense of expectation and a sense of, uh, of welcome to our visitors. If there's any fear or negativity, um, being um, really deeply skeptical and all that, the, the whole vibration of the group just goes down. And I think that I know that the, um, the star beings that we want to connect with uh, will not approach us. Uh, the ones that love us will not want to harm us. So they wouldn't want to cause a fear reaction, say a heart attack or a stroke in somebody if they did, if they showed up and did something dramatic. So they're very well aware of, of our, um, our intentions and where we're coming from when we attempt the contact. Now, what can people do? I know that during our retreats, uh, one of the things, and we have um, uh, in-person retreats that we hold every year at three different places in the United States. Uh, my wife, Hollis, um, teaches an exercise to help people confront what fear they might have and to deal with it and, and to try to get over it. So that's one remedy we have. Now, um, what I maybe would like to get her to do someday is to um, get on a video and, and offer that so that we would be able to um, offer her technique to, to everybody really easily so that they can remove that fear. Um, in general, if you come to etletstalk.com and you can join as a free member, you can talk to other people who've been through this. Uh, I find that people talking it out, and we do this again in a group circle at our retreats, we, uh, we have a little bit of group therapy where people voice with what's going on with them and other people who've been through that fear can speak up and, and help people. I've seen this work very well, as a matter of fact. Uh, so there's the group support that will help people. And um, 
Yeah, that basically that's it. It's 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 a matter of getting together with others who've been through this, whether it's one on one with a friend or in a group situation. Um, on Facebook, I have a group where uh, people come there and they tell their stories. And that's also a good platform for someone to make a post and say, I have a little bit of fear. What do you guys recommend? So in that case, the community then can respond to that post and, and give some help to that person. So help is available and it means uh, joining a community somehow and, uh, and using the help and experience that other people have who've been through what you have in terms of the fear. Okay, Carsten is asking, can you give a small in instruction of how you do CE5, just very shortly? Yes, um, and again, it can be done solo or in a, gr in a group. Uh, most people prefer to be with a group. Uh, what we do is we uh, often get in a circle, if we can, where we can face each other. Um, we get into a silence. We close our eyes, we connect heart to heart, and we, do, we use visualization. And we imagine the energy going around in a circle, connecting us with our hearts to each other. We also visualize a uh, uh, kind of a group soul in the middle of our circle. Um, and even if we're not physically in the circle, we, in our imagination, we build a circle. So, so that, that's easy enough to do. Uh, but we connect through our hearts to the, to the center of this circle. And from that group mind, that group soul, we send up a beam of light uh, of invitation and we shoot it up into space. And we ask that all the uh, benevolent civilizations out there that can detect our love that's in it, our desire to connect, that if they, when they see that beacon or detect it in some way, that they respond to us. And when we do our monthly global CE5s where many teams around the planet uh, join in, then we also, as part of our visualization, um, include all those other groups because we're a community. You know, one group, uh, rather many groups are better than even one group. So when we join as a community and visualize all our friends there in Denmark or other parts of the world, and we have teams all over the world, we visualize them sending up their beams of light and that we are connected in a network with them. So it's a horizontal network where we connect with each other in our group. We connect horizontally with other groups around the world through our hearts. And as we send up our beams of welcome, we are connecting with our cosmic friends and our cosmic friends love that. They, they do find many creative and diverse ways to let us know that they're communicating. It's not just the lights in the sky, but there are many other phenomena that happen. And I can talk about that if you want. But, but basically, our heart, our imagination, our goodwill, um, our consciousness, the, this is this, the, the tool that we, that we need. Uh, um, I do say that um, when people become free members at etletstalk.com, I have a seven-step protocol there that is very much like what I was just describing. Uh, it's important that, I, I mean, I know people take those seven steps and they, they modify them. They add radar detectors, they add toning. Some people like to do oming or some other spiritual thing and they mix it up. And uh, all that enhances the experience for people, I understand. But what I do ask people at the very core what really will get you the contact is not all those other things, although those are things are good for putting you in a good mood, in a high vibration mood, and that's great. But really what our friends are looking for is, is this right here. This is the main instrument that you need and your imagination and sending out your love and raising your vibration. That basically is all you need. And, that's, and I ask people to, at, at the very foundation, to start with this and then if they like I said they want to add gentle music and chanting and other things to enhance your experience that's great but just start with this right here and that's really what will get you the contact okay so um, I think we would like to to hear a bit about uh, you know other experiences than just seeing lights in the sky and um, one of our members, Pia, um, was asking that, uh, do you have to meditate to, to get contact? You know, I used to think you do, uh, but the truth is, not really. Um, 
it's a place to start. I, I would say it's a great place to start. You do not have to be a master meditator who's done this for 20 years or has studied with a teacher. Anybody that can just become silent, still make their thoughts still, um, get comfortable in their body and use their imagination and follow this seven step process that that's on my website can do this. Uh, uh, and you can do it for five minutes or an hour, whatever you're predisposed. So I don't want the fact that people might feel they have to be master meditators to stop you from trying this. Um, everyone has to start somewhere. So even if you're not that master meditator, I'm not, but I certainly could sit down and do the very basic things I've been describing here and close my eyes and, and make the request and use my imagination and link up with other people. That's a good start. I, I do know that once a group of star friends, star people, and they like to be called star people, by the way, they've told me that, not aliens, I don't like that. Star people, they have told us that they are our elder brothers, sisters, and cousins, and to think of them as family, and not as gods, but as um, family. So, um, kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, well, it was about, uh, you don't have to, to be a great master of meditation to do this. Thank you. <laughs> um, once they have found you the first time, they've detected your frequency and they know how to reconnect. So to answer the, the question a little bit more, no, you likely don't have to meditate after that, but I think meditation is a good thing because when you're with a, with a group, it, it's, it's really nice. Uh, the energy flows and everybody has, I think it amplifies the experience. However, again, having said that, once they, our star friends know your vibration, your frequency, there are times, for example, I have a friend um, in my, my core group here at home who has a home on a hill that overlooks the Pacific Ocean. She has a back deck that faces out over the ocean. Her star friends are so connected to her, she just walks, opens the door, walks out on her deck outside, facing the ocean and she looks up and she waves and goes, Yoo-hoo, I'm here. And they start flashing in the sky right away. She sees them zigzagging. They will do that while she's walking her dog. She'll look up and she'll wave and say, I'm here. And she'll get an immediate response. And I know this sounds crazy, but um, I know this person. It's been happening for 10 years and it happens as easily as, you know, me ringing a doorbell and having someone open the door and answer you know, for her, I would like for that ease to be something that everybody experiences. Uh, so I tell people, keep trying. Maybe someday it will be that way for all of us, that easy. So the answer, the, sh the, the short answer is, no, you don't have to meditate. It's a good place to start. Do it when you can. But again, once they find you, uh, they know your heart. You just put the request out and likely they'll show up in ways that you may not expect. Okay. We have a couple of questions from two of our members and I'll take the last one first. Um, what kind of location for CE5 would you recommend? Any place that is safe and convenient and comfortable for you. That could be your living room, um, an office, a den. It could be out in nature in a forest. It could be by the beach. So it depends on the experience. If you want to see the lights in the sky, obviously find a location outside that is um, uh, that gives you a dark sky um, that's comfortable. You know, you don't want to be in a snowstorm. A place you feel safe, uh, that's quiet, where you're not distracted and where you can just tune into the, the universe that way because you're, you're feeling comfortable and you're not hot, you're not cold, you know, you're, you're, you've taken care of the physical body. So when you're outside, uh, find that place wherever that might be. And again, inside you can control your environment probably a lot easier. So you can create uh, a CE5 experience inside. Now you may not see lights in the sky, but, uh, you sometimes may actually see beings with your psychic senses. If you're psychic, they're with you. Many times in our group, we have seen them in there with us, uh, surrounding our circle. We have felt waves of love come over us. We have seen lights 
going, you know, in the air around us. We have seen lights turn on and off. I mean, the physical <laughs> light bulb lights on and off, or maybe one of our smartphones, which was turned off, powered off, will suddenly power up on its own and start playing some song that's very cosmic in, 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 a, in a way of kind of like announcing that they're here. And when, and when I say that they have many creative ways, this is, these are some of the examples of the creative ways they have to contact us, whether we're inside or outside. I'm not sure if that answered the question, but let me know if it didn't and I can elaborate some more. I think it did. Thank you. Um, one of our members, Stich, uh, wants to know which insights have our, our star friends provided regarding the current coronavirus situation? Interesting. They, um, now, let me first start by saying, if you're on the internet at all, you know there are many conspiracy theories about it started this way, started that way, whatever. I'm not focused on that, but I did ask the star friends, and they have said that at a very deep level, humanity is going through a process of change, of raising our consciousness. We're at a critical point in our Earth's history. We can destroy the planet in many different ways, as many of us know. Uh, and it's important that we, through love, evolve and open our consciousness and do better start treating each other as humans better, find ways to get along and create a golden age, a new world. So that's kind of where we are in the big picture. And that's what the, my people's love Alliance is about. There are many millions of us doing this. Um, wow. I forgot the question. Please repeat that to me because I, I will get back to it. <laughs> this yeah. happens. That's quite all right. Um, which insights have your star friends provided regarding the current coronavirus situa okay. situation? Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, so they, they have said that we are at this critical point in our history and uh, we chose as humans at a very deep level, we chose this as the way for us to take the next step to evolve. They tell us that there were more violent alternatives that we could have chosen, which would have shaken us to get us to wake up, to get along with each other, to love each other, rather than continuing down the, the destructive paths of hating each other and destroying the climate and making each other starve and all that. Something needed to shake us up. This virus is what we chose as humanity as the least violent way to achieve our emergence, our awakening. So as bad as it seems, it really is an opportunity for all of us to pause. And I think a lot of people have done this all over the world. It has caused many of us to pause and to look where we've been. Here's the world we've created. You know, we've stopped moving around for a few weeks or a few months because we've had to. And we can look around and say, you know, do I want to continue like this? Do I want to continue having a materialistic, a greedy, hateful global society, or is there something better? And so this is an opportunity for us to find other people who are, have been looking around and who want a better world to align ourselves, to gather together. We're here in our millions. We just need to find each other and work together and meditate, pray, do rituals, whatever, for a new world. So this virus is Horrible as it is, like I said, they've told us was the least violent way. We could have had huge cataclysms, you know, on a global scale, not just a volcano here and there. We could have had something terribly globally destructive. We could have had uh, a limited nuclear war of some kind, whatever. But this virus, as bad as it is, is uh, just an opportunity to move forward. And they tell us a golden age is possible. That's why these civilizations are here. They, they have detected that we're ready to take a leap forward if we want to, a positive leap forward and create a golden age on earth here. So they've been here to give us that message that they're here to help. They love us. And they're watching this corona 
um, situation we're in to see how we will respond. Will we step up uh, while we're taking care of each other and trying to heal those? And um, we're doing all that, but we're, we're finding many people are suddenly helping their neighbors. They're, um, they're doing things they never thought before. And all that is about love emerging, the great emergence. Okay, thank you. Um, our member Sim would like to know, are there going to be more updates on ET Let's Talk YouTube channel? There will be. Um, I have a webinar coming um, June 20th, where I'll be talking more in depth about the, the People's Disclosure Movement and the People's Love Alliance. And it will be dealing with the topics we've been talking about here. So that will be an update. And it's also going to be a, a question and answer, a Q&A opportunity for people to uh, like to interact the way that we're doing right here. Um, I um, have been advertising this. I just started yesterday um, on social media and I sent out an email to my whole community yesterday. So if you want some details, uh, you can uh, either go to uh, etletstalk.com and become a free member and you'll get details about this next update. Uh, and it'll be uploaded to YouTube so that even if somebody can't join us on the 20th of June, then, then we will archive the, um, the session and put it up on the channel. So thank you for asking. I appreciate people's interest in this uh, because, you know, folks, we're, we're all in this together. Like I said, when I say people's disclosure, I mean all of us. Everyone is a leader. Uh, I, I am offering what I have, my vision, uh, my resources, but I know that there are so many others out there who are also leaders and can start their own groups, their own networks. They have resources I might not have. So we should think of ourselves all together as being that people's disclosure. We're moving forward as a group. It's a group mission. Mission. It's not about just one leader. Uh, like I say, we're all leaders if we want to be. I understand that recently there was a record breaking in numbers of participating global groups uh, on the monthly CE5 meditation. Um, hooray. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great news. But the, how many are we now in this group? The, the ones that I hear from, and I understand that, like anything, you, you might, in a community, there might be only. 1% or 10% of people who will write and communicate and everyone else is there, right? That's well known. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the monthly groups where we do our coordinated uh, global C5 meditation, it can be anywhere from two to 400 groups around the world. Uh, and, and that has grown over the years. What I would love to see is 2,000 or 20,000 or 2 million and in time, that will happen. And that's why I encourage people to be leaders. That's how our, our um, community is, is growing. When you teach somebody else and bring them in and get them to have their own experience, and then they get excited. So our monthly groups are in the hundreds as groups. But as I mentioned before, the, the community is around 50,000 or more people who are doing um, CE5 maybe once a month, maybe twice a week uh, on their own schedule because this, you can do this, you know, however it is convenient for you. So it's not just the once a month thing we do, but I encourage people to do the CE5 as often as they want. Some people do that, do it daily and have an ongoing communication. Some people because of their schedules can only do it once a month, but there's 50,000 of us and growing all the time. And that seems like a huge number, but, uh, it could be a lot bigger and we're the first wave. We're the way shores. There will be many behind us who will be doing this. So it's our responsibility to, to show that it works, that it's positive, that we do have a loving connection with those that want to help us from the stars and to find others and, and get them excited and inspire them too. As I mentioned before, there's 1.3 billion people that believe in what we're doing theoretically but they don't know about us. You know, the mainstream media is not publicizing what you and I are doing. They're talking about the fear factor of the Pentagon releasing videos and, and casting it as a threat because that's how the military people think. 
you know, they, they may see an object in the sky and the first thing they're thinking about is, is it friend, is it foe? How can I defend against it? Uh, it is intruded upon my airspace, upon my territory. I must send up a jet after it. Let me take pictures of it. Let me alert other people that this could be a threat. This is the way that they think. And the rest of us who've had loving contact think differently. We know differently. So um, I ask people again to keep doing their own contact because the mainstream media is not showing the 1.3 billion of us who believe this is peaceful contact. And so um, the CE5 uh, will, will be a great thing, you know, to go against uh, um, an alleged false flag operation where the military would like us to think that uh, the star people are our enemies. Absolutely. Uh, the star people have said over and over, don't concentrate on ourselves being victims of anything, whether it's a virus, whether it's a false flag attack, whether it's any of the many ways that, in fact, those who've done this cover-up have used against us. They said that is very low vibration at this time. It's not denying that things have been done or that there are those in power who don't want to give up their power. So let them keep trying to make their plans. The power we have is to stay very solid, number one, in our own spiritual being, whatever we conceive that to be, because our star friends have said that w even one person standing in the light and the truth and the strength and the power of their own being, that one person is more powerful than a million people cowering in fear. So do you want to be one of the millions cowering in fear of a false flag? I'm not. I've chosen to be the one person, and I know there's others like me. So we use CE5 to keep our connection with our benevolent star brothers and sisters and, and cousins, uh, because they see all this. They know this is being planned. Uh, but the way out of it is not to try to fight it. Uh, we educate it as... as, as it might be a possibility that it could happen, fine, but let's move on. Let's move on in strength and create the world that we want, not as victims, but as powerful leaders now. We, we've got to change that mindset. You know, let, let's not look in fear. Let's look the other way away from fear, and that's love. We find the love of our other human beings who, who see this game that's being played, but we reject that game. Of, of the fear and the false flag. And instead we're creating a new world. We're helping our neighbor. We're building uh, societies. We're feeding others. We're, we're creating the golden age. We're investing ourselves in it. And, and, and that's how in our power we grow and the strength we have. Plus we share our stories. If anybody comes up to you and says, evil aliens, you know, the, the false flag, you say, no, I know about a thousand people and you can go here, listen to all the stories of people who've had positive contact and now try to tell me that that uh, this this attack is real. It's not. The People's Disclosure Movement is our our strength and our um, our defense, our CE5, uh, against any other narrative because we know we know that it's positive. We know that that they're friendly, and that's where we're gonna. That's our story. We're gonna stick to that. Great. We have one last question from our member, Pia. Uh, you talk about free membership uh, of ET Let's Talk. Are there paying members too? No, it's always been free. Um, I've resisted the attempt to, to do that uh, because I want the CE5 protocol and, and all that to, to be accessible to everybody. Um, in the past, I've had, um, I have had websites many, many years ago where we had a paid subscription, uh, which actually was very helpful because it helped to finance uh, the work. Uh, so far, all this work is pretty much voluntary. I have volunteers helping me. Uh, people do make donations, which are very much appreciated because there are costs associated with keeping a website running. Um, but right now that membership is free. If I ever do anything that's on a paid basis, rest assured that the very basic stuff of making contact and enjoying the community will always be free to people. The only other thing I do is uh, for the retreats that I hold physically 
in three different places across the United States. Um, I do ask for tuition there because it's a, a big expense to, to uh, find locations and to, uh, to create the, that experience. So that money just goes right back into to keeping ET Let's Talk sustained and active. Uh, operate on a very, very low budget. <laughs> but uh, this is not meant to be a money-making operation. It's not a, a business. This is meant to, to be available as much as possible. And when I do have to charge for something, I try to charge the most reasonable low fee, which doesn't always happen in this community um, uh, because I want this accessible to everybody. This is the future. And, and I, so I appreciate that question. Well, thank you so much, Costa, for being here with us. It's been very inspiring. And uh, hopefully there will be more, much more members joining ET Let's Talk. And um, if people want to contact you, they, they can go to your website, etletstalk.com, or contact you at face, uh, on Facebook, uh, ET Let's Talk. Um, on Facebook, it's a group called CE5 UFO Sirius. Uh, if you put that in the search, you'll come up on it. We have about um, almost 4,000, 3,500 members right now. And people are welcome to join there. I, I can also be contacted by email um, by sending your email to Costa, K-O-S-T-A, at etletstalk.com. And I always appreciate hearing from people and hearing their stories because everyone's got a story. And I love connecting people to others sometimes around them. We have a member map on the website. So when you're a member, you can look at your location visually and see if there are people around you that you can contact uh, to do CE5. Well, thank you so much, Costa. Sure. And um, yeah, take care and stay safe. See you around. Yeah, and the same to all of you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to all of you. Take care. Thank you.